um, starting with Wallace J. Nichols, um, who is a marine biologist and best-selling author who's been focused on the oceans and also across many sectors to improve businesses, agencies, teams, and organizations in our changing world. So welcome, Jay. Thank you for being here. Um, and we have John, AKA Cynthia Hardy, <laughs> as part of uh, our next uh, panelist, virtual panelist. John and I have been friends for many years. In fact, I think we kicked off our relationship on a sustainable fashion panel about probably 15 years ago. Um, and uh, John is the founder of John Hardy Jewelry um, and is also just an iconic leader in the environmental movement, has just been such a, a force, the founder of Green School uh, Bali, which now they also have Tulum and New Zealand. I'll let John speak more to that, but um, just, uh, I think the greenest school in the world, right, John? And greenest, uh, greenest school on earth. On earth, yes, I guess. Different way of saying the same thing. <laughs> um, and also, and I, and I feel so uh, honored, blessed. I actually got to be at the launch of the Green School in Bali, I guess a decade plus ago. Um, and, um, and then we have Kate, who is our uh, Plastic Free Mermaid. So excited to dive in with you, Kate, and learn more about your work as well. So um, very excited to have all of you. And of course, our topic today is fashion in the oceans. Um, we, uh, just a little bit about my background, just to frame this, I have spent the past over 25 years driving sustainable fashion forward. I coined the term eco fashion in 1995 and have been in the trenches, uh, trying to revolutionize the fashion industry after spending nearly a decade on, uh, inorganic and natural food and beauty products. Um, I authored the book that's behind me called Eco Renaissance co-creating a stylish, sexy, and sustainable world. And the premise really is through the lens of design, we can change the world. And design being how we design our food, our beauty, our fashion, our businesses, our, you know, our voices in the world. And that um, really it's about no compromise. It's about yes and. It's not about, you know, social and environmental responsibility, um, compromising style, quality fit, color, comfort, price. It's about having all of it embedded as one transparent, authentic uh, product, service, um, and ultimately for companies in the world today to be thinking about, you know, what is that life cycle of, you know, the, the products they're making and are those products ending up in, you know, destroying our planet, uh, our oceans, our ecosystems. And just to kind of um, set the tone for this talk, you know, one of the, the reasons we're here today, and um, I thank Global Fashion Exchange and the United Nations uh, World Ocean Day um, and Peace Boat um, and all of the, the other organizers of this incredible event um, is that, you know, this is Plastic Free July. So every month, of course, should be plastic free, but today or this month in particular, we are really focusing on um, telling this story, educating people and amplifying the message that, you know, business as usual is not okay. Uh, the World Economic Forum states there will be more plastic than fish mass in the, our oceans by 2050. More than 8 million tons of plastic waste are entering our oceans every year. One plastic bottle can break down into 10 million micro pieces. According to the Ocean Conservancy, plastic has been found in more than 60% of all seabirds and 100% of sea turtle species. I know that's a passion point for you, Jay, um, that mistake plastic for food. And just to speak to textiles specifically, in the fashion industry, over 65% of fibers produced are synthetic and petroleum based. And for those of you who don't know, of course, every single synthetic garment in the history of mankind does not biodegrade, which means every time we wash them, those synthetic microfiber particles are going into our water systems through our washing machines, ultimately into our rivers and landing in our oceans, where about a third of the plastic in the oceans today is actually synthetic textile microfibers. So it's a real serious issue. Um, each year, our laundry attributes around half a million 
uh, tons of plastic, microplastics into our waterways um, as there's almost 3 billion polyester shirts out there. So, um, and then just last, water treatment plants um, uh, led up to 40% of microplastics into our waterways. So even through filtering, that's not solving the issue. So just kind of, again, framing the topic, I'd love to kick off now and maybe we can um, dive a little bit more into your backgrounds. Let's start with John. Um, so <clears throat> I know that in addition to obviously uh, your jewelry company that you founded and the Green School and um, your incredible bed and breakfast um, that uh, I personally love and have been the two minutes several times um, and all of your family's great work. I mean, your daughters and you know, Alora and I go way back and obviously we've, we've made t-shirts, the Matriarch and Now t-shirts um, and you've been to Metaware. I'd love to hear a little bit more about, kind of share with everybody your background, um, a little bit more in detail and, and the work, the great work that your family and, and you are doing around the world at this point. Well, in the interest of domestic bliss, <laughs> Cynthia and I co-founded Green School co-founded the jewelry company. <laughs> I have a lot of ideas and she makes them happen. And I'd just be a crazy guy with too many ideas without her. So let's put a mark on the wall for Cynthia. I wish she was here with us, but I'm the talker. So what to say about um, what's going on. I had my first experiences with plastic when I was six, working in my grandfather's general store in a small village north of Toronto, a thousand people in the village on a good day, my grandpa paid me $5 a week. And it was a good place to work. But I burned the plastic out behind the, out behind the store in a 45 gallon drum and all the other garbage, which was one of my jobs. So it's a long history of, uh, of abuse and it's, uh, a short time left to do something about it. So I'm very committed to mitigating some of the damage that I've done personally. And I guess that transits into personal choices. Uh, we teach kids at green school that they are in charge when they have the money and they are standing at the counter, their choices make a difference as it does with all of us. And if you make the right choices with your money, the products that, that are recyclable, that are, that are reusable, can be chosen rather than just blindly going, there's nothing I can do, I'm just one person. So each individual and what we choose is so important to what future we have. Absolutely, and maybe just add on, um one of my my most memorable moments staying with you is our morning trash walks maybe um just share a little bit about you know i know you're stateside right now but when you are in bali well we've been walking for 40 years and the garbage was just getting more and more the balinese started out with 100 percent recyclable packaging palm leaves bamboo baskets, all those things. They just tossed them and they went back to the earth. And as plastic became more and more part of the world, we decided to clean it up. And walking every morning with a spear in a bag, it's not making a big difference to the amount of plastic going on the ocean, but it's making a big difference to the people of Bali. We have endless people stop with, um, with beautiful cars and open the door and stick their thumb out the window and go like this. They are so happy to see people and we've taken people, we've taken billionaires, butchers, and every other kind of person on these walks and they're so happy to see us lending a hand to clean up the plastic because they know it's not good for them, they know it's not good for the island but they really don't know what to do. But we do have a solution. It's all about solutions, right? As Albert Einstein said, we can't solve today's problems with the same consciousness that created them, right? So we need to redesign and, and be 
driven with solutions. So thank you for, for that great work. And um, all right, moving on to Jay. So I would love you to tell everybody about your book, Blue Mind, and the importance of building a connection to water. I know that's been a big part of your life work. Yes, Ed. Um, thanks for inviting me to join this panel. I'm a fan of all of yours. And, uh, and I think directly and indirectly a recipient of your good work, because I've, I've met so many of the great students from the Green School um, in my work, just a, always a, a bright spot in a, any group, any students that have, have spent time at the Green School bring, um, they're just, they've, they've clearly learned uh, a lot about how to be a good human and, um, and spread it around the world. So thank you, John, for, for that, and Cynthia, and everybody yeah. else who's educating Perfect. these kids. And, and, uh, but um, the, um, so Blue Mind, I'm a marine biologist, I'm a, a turtle, geek i guess you could say i love sea turtles they that's been basically the the theme of my life um to put it mildly and i'm an ocean guy but i i always noticed that whenever i was in the water any kind of water and um all mermaids will relate to this i guess this is a, a fact <laughs> when when whenever i was near the water in the water i got calm and i as a kid, I stuttered. Uh, I, I was called shy, but I was really an introvert. And the water was my happy place. Because people don't talk to you underwater. They just, you know, leave you alone. So I always knew that water made me feel better. But then talking to my colleagues, uh, fellow marine biologists and ocean advocates, that they felt the same way. So as a scientist, I became curious about the science behind that feeling. So I went looking for a book about it and couldn't find one. <laughs> uh, I thought maybe it was written in another language or out of print, um, but I still couldn't find it. Tried to convince some smart people that they should write it. And I failed at that. And sometimes when you're left with a vacuum, you're, your only other choice is to fill it. Uh, and I think we've all experienced that in some way or another. Something needs to be done. You're looking for somebody to do it. There's nobody, so you step in and you start doing morning walks or what, you, know, you, you build a green school or you, you know, start being an advocate for a plastic-free life or you invent eco-fashion, as the case may be. So five years later, I published Blue Mind. And so the, the point being a Blue Mind is a term that refers to this universal um, response to water that all all societies, all spiritual traditions, all people have in them. Uh, it, it's that calm, mildly meditative state that water puts us in. You don't need to know how to meditate. You don't even to want to meditate. When you get near, in, on, or underwater, it puts you into a different place that we call blue mind. Um, we've researched the science behind it, and that's fascinating. Um, but I think it's relevant to this conversation because um, that part of the value of healthy waters and oceans is usually left out of our talking points. Whether it's a school, an NGO, a government agency, we usually, we usually omit the emotional health benefits of a healthy planet. And they're enormous and they're for all people and they have been for all time. And so when we, undervalue anyone or anything, bad things happen. We know that we, we're experiencing that right now, um, both in society with our human relationships, but also with our, our relationships with the natural world. So the contribution of Blue Mind is to help fix that broken value equation. And I think that's probably the kind of a theme of all of our work is that we work with kids, we work with fashion designers, we work with the general public um, to fix a broken equation where we've undervalued each other and we've undervalued a healthy planet. And in doing so, we let bad things happen. So um, but I love, I love um, hearing from people about their blue mind experiences, their transcendent magical moments alone or with others. Um, when they're in their water. And it's not just oceans, it's lakes and rivers and pools and ponds and waterfalls and rainstorms and fog banks and 
uh, ice and snow even. So I'll stop there, but that's what Blue Mind's all about. I love it. Wow. Yeah, that's amazing. And as a, a, a wellness advocate for three decades, I would say, you know, and also a Florida girl uh, raised in Florida and the ocean and the water has always been so integral to me and it's where it's my happy place, no matter where I am in the world. So um, I appreciate your work. There's a, there's a little piece there that coming from the conversation about sustainability. Um, I think emotional health is the basis of sustainability and maybe that's a topic we can all uh, chime in on, but if, if you don't have an emotionally health an emotionally healthy self uh, or family or community or business or team, you're not sustainability is just not going to be a successful endeavor. And so that's a, a piece of the conversation that's often left out too. Right? Yeah, no, I love that. And I mean, it is as we've all know through our careers and being sort of in this con world of consciousness that mind, body, spirit are all very much interconnected in terms of to be truly in alignment with our personal values, our professional values, and our sense of, of self are all, you know, vital in that uh, DNA or foundation of, of, as you said, you know, driving sustainability, driving wellness, driving um, a shift, you know, and a paradigm shift across uh, humanity. And that is really the basis of eco-renaissance, right, which is the rebirth of humanity. Um, and that is the word renaissance. So I based on and, and the awakening that we are all part of a collective ecosystem and the relationship with our oceans and our land are part of who we are. Right. So on that note, um, Kate, please share with us, you know, your story about uh, the last 11 years. And I think that's very apropos. My favorite number is 11 because one plus one equals 11. We're always stronger together than we are apart. And that's been part of my own personal mantra. Um, and so I'd love to hear over the last 11 years what your journey has looked like. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Marcy, for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet you and, and learn all about your incredible work in the fashion industry and industry that um, so needs change and, and has the, the potential to influence great change. And, um, Jay, I met you at um, the uh, Youth Summit for the Plastic Pollution um, Youth Summit hosted by Algalita Foundation just recently, which was my last time in the US, which is exciting. A lot of amazing humans there. And John, so wonderful to meet you digitally. I know many of your students, they're inspiring. I know many friends of the Green School, so it's really an honor and a pleasure to be here, even though it's midnight my time. <laughs> So it's very fun to be here. Um, yeah, thank you, Marcy, for the introduction. I quit using single-use plastics um, over a decade ago, basically when I learned that plastic doesn't biodegrade for about a thousand years. Um, I come from the same world that we all do, where I was just using so much plastic on a daily basis, um, especially 10 years ago, right? It was, you know, I was in college, and so I had um, just constant sort of consuming of, of this material. Um, and I'm a mermaid. I free dive, I surf, I sail. Um, I have a big relationship with nature, especially with the ocean. Um, and I benefit so much from the Blue Mind experience, as Jay was talking about. Uh, emotionally, physically, mentally, spiritually. So to know that my daily life was contributing to um, the decimation of my blue mind, of my temple, of my playground, of this place, the, the ocean that I, I hold in such high regard that, um, you know, we know so little about right now even, you know, we know so little about the ocean and, and the incredible um, ecosystems and, and creatures that live there. So uh, yeah, I just, I was horrified that I, my, just living my life was was polluting the ocean so much. Um, so I decided to just put a hard boundary down against plastics. Um, of all the things stressing our planet, of all the things out of control, this was one thing that I could control. Uh, so I quit single use plastics. And then of course my definition of single use continued to expand outward as I realized how ubiquitous plastic truly is. Um, all this food packaging is single use and this shampoo bottle is single use, right? Because I'm not reusing it. So the decision was immediate, but the transition to truly living plastic free took a while. Um, and so now I teach that lifestyle. 
because I've done all the hard work and um, I've seen kind of the, the opening similar to what Jay said, looking for um, people or, or, or solutions or guidance on how to live plastic free was really difficult. I didn't see any of that educational resources available except for my grandparents. You know, I was like, how did you used to do things before plastic? So it, this whole lifestyle has been such a beautiful journey of reconnection to nature, to elders, um, to slowing down. So, so many amazing benefits to this lifestyle not selling it or anything um but yeah i just i chose to use what i was good at which is marketing which is social media and i saw this opportunity 10 years ago oh my gosh things are going so digital we're connecting we're learning we're we're um you know consuming information online through our devices so how can i use this to influence social change how can i influence behavior change by leading by example and making it look good and offering this easy resource to people so i teach as plastic free mermaid online my plastic free life amazing what are um a, a few different sort of top tips that you would share um, to the audience, you know, as far as how to get started. Yeah, um, I, I think doing a trash audit is a really great place to start. Just holding on to all the trash that you use over a week, keeping all the little sauce packets and cutlery and all the dirty little to go containers for your food and wrappers and anything you're throwing out like shampoo bottles, or whatever, keeping all of it washing it and drying it so that it's not smelly. Um, and then you really see the plastic that you personally are consuming. Uh, I think I can tell people, bring your own reusable water bottle, bring your own coffee cup, you know, pack your snacks to go. But unless you look at the trash that you personally, the plastic you, you use, uh, that helps you know then what to target. It helps you identify, oh, okay, I, maybe I need to look up mermaids you know, plant milk recipe because I'm using all this milk. I've got all these milk containers in my trash can or um, I've got beauty products. Oh, I wonder what are some alternatives or maybe I can look for things packaged in glass. Um, oh, all these, you know, veggie wrappers or, or um, produce wrappers. Maybe I can look at my farmer's market to, to buy some fresh unwrapped unpackaged produce. So focus on the trash that you personally consume and then you can build a strategy around that. Amazing. Thank you. Um, so how would each of you define the idea of making Earth cool again? So, how, you know, the relationship between climate change, the ocean, plastic, how would you just somewhat organically answer that question? How are we going to make Earth cool again? John? Well, I realized that the best and the brightest are not going to work for the government these days. They're going to work for the corporates. And they truly are intelligent, bright young minds. They're just doing some things that are not good for the planet and not good for their children or their grandchildren. So it's really strange to ask an NGO or an underfunded government or anyone to deal with plastic. These bright young minds are creating plastic in 10,000 different ways to do 10,000 sales. And it's just impossible. Actually, 10% of plastic, they don't have to declare what it is. It's the secret ingredient which makes it impossible to recycle for people that are in, in an NGO. You've all traveled a lot and the highest mountain and the farthest island has had its plastic delivered. Now we shouldn't go into what was in the plastic and how bad that is for, for the people and the planet, but these corporates get the plastic everywhere. I'm, I'm just astounded. I was in Ladakh and in 10 years, women were coming down the trail with Cheetos in a bag and feeding it to their children because that was the single symbol that they were advanced and moving into the future and becoming Canadians. So the only hope is the corporates and the little tiny thing we did is we, we did the penny challenge. 
when you see a penny on the street, almost everyone picks it up. I don't know with COVID now, whether all the pennies are still on the street, but traditionally people pick them up. In Canada, we call it a lucky penny. So until the plastic packaging has a monetary value stamped on it, it's um, nothing is going to happen because it's hard to know what it is. It's hard to know what's in it. And asking people to recycle their own plastic is liking, is, is really a big stretch. So what we did is we um, put 500 pieces of all kinds of plastic packaging. We put a symbol on the back that was 100 roots. We set up a little stall in the food stall that sells this packaging and this food. And the grandmothers and the kids came out and saw that those plastic things in the ditch and on the road were worth 100 roots, which is less than a penny. And they brought them all back and they were very happy to do that cash transaction. Now the corporates are pushing 100 tons of plastic up the mountain, which is dumped everywhere, eventually to end up in the ocean. And the truck goes back empty. So once you bind the corporates to taking a tiny bit of their profit, and with the price of oil, they're having parties because the price of packaging just went through the floor because of the price of oil. And the amount of money that a recycler gets it gets for that plastic today is it's doesn't it breaks the whole system. Cheap oil just destroys recycling. So the second the corporates take take responsibility for their packaging, they will change it. They will change it to make it. And there was a fabulous example in, uh, in Holland. McDonald's came to a village in Holland and the Dutch are pretty smart and they do a really good job with their garbage. And they came to McDonald's and gave them the bill for the garbage that they'd calculated they were gonna dump in the local community. And McDonald's, you know, the guy saw his profit tick back a quarter of a point and was afraid of being transferred to some far country. So he said, no, we, we're not gonna pay you to do the plastic. They actually did their own recycling. And there were McDonald's garbage trucks picking up McDonald's garbage. And the second that these smart boys were in charge of picking up the garbage and recycling it, they started talking to the guys that were making the garbage, making the packaging and saying, listen, you can't make it like that. You have to make it like this. And the last thing I'll say is I really want to have a delegation from Green School go to the Plastic Manufacturers Award Ceremony, which probably isn't being held because of COVID, because they celebrate everything about plastic, except there's no category for recyclable. There's no category for degradable. It's only cool and hip and better. And the only mission that these guys are on is to get people all over the world to pick it up on the shelf, take it to the cash register, and it's gone. So it's so important because the corporates, a product with a one penny in, in developing, in the developing world, a one penny cash redemption on any piece of plastic means it isn't on the street. It's back to the store that bought it. And ultimately the corporates will figure out how to recycle it. They're the smart guys and they've got the cash. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, it's staggering. And, and again, you know, the power of business, I agree with you wholeheartedly, you know, has a lot more influence, you know, to, to change the world, I think, than government. So I think we need to leverage, you know, Kate, as she mentioned, as an influencer to educate and activate people, but also as a as an entrepreneur, I feel a, a sense of responsibility. Um, you know that has definitely been you know a, a driver in in my path and my journey for the past three decades. So um, I think what's exciting right now with COVID, or what I believe, is people are resetting their priorities and thinking about you know how are they going to. Um, integrate these kinds of values into their businesses because I mean frankly you know I'm a believer that it's not even about staying ahead anymore as a business person it's about not being left behind if you're not thinking about you know embedding uh, social environmental uh, 
strategy into your, your business model, you're going to be out of the game. It's just a question of when I think the, you know, I think right now there's a lot of work to do clearly, but, um, we need to just keep, you know, it, it's a blessing that you've created these green schools to really ultimately, uh, help, you know, create, uh, the, the entrepreneurs of the future. And I've met many of them that you've sent my way that are just rock stars with their mindsets. And it is going to be up to the next generation, I, I believe, to really, you know, uh, hone that and, and make it absolutely um, no longer a choice, but an imperative in their businesses. I, um, I have a tiny little, tiny little thing that just yeah. happened. The corporates blew my mind because they came back they came out against making money from hate and they all canceled their advertising with Facebook. And this was an impossibility, but the first corporate that takes back all their packaging will be the heroes. It would be the best marketing move they could possibly make. It's just go, we're a hundred percent taking our plastic back and paying people for it. And that will make them heroes and that will, put them ahead of all the other corporates that are getting it to the local government or the local NGO to recycle. Just curious, how many um, local um, Balinese are, are part of the program you've created where they are collecting trash for cash, um, your, your program, not just the trash walk, but ultimately um, how you've, you've turned this into a, a local, phenomenon really where there's you know everybody's engaged it seemed like well the way we came to this corporate program putting it back to them is it absolutely doesn't work it it's too difficult to turn a plastic bag or a or an aqua bottle into money and with the price of plastic right now the price of oil it's just a complete dead end. It's a, it's a myth. The only people that can do this successfully are the people that put it on the shelves. They have the trucks, they have the brains, they have the best and the brightest. Okay. Good food for thought. Um, mm -hmm. I'd love uh, Jay to hear, you know, kind of your thoughts on how has, the, um, first of all, how, how do we make the earth cool again, right? Um, and from the lens of uh, the ocean, all of this, you know, pollution in the oceans that's ultimately, of course, affecting the ecosystems. And ultimately, I would suspect is also affecting the blue mind, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I would love to hear your thoughts on, on that as well. Well, there's a lot of people who are, who are making the earth cool. I think um, one of the things we can do is, is have their backs, support them, lock lock arms, lock legs, lock fingers, lock minds, lock eyes, so that nobody feels alone out there. There's a lot of, a lot of young, bright, clever people, as John says, and, you know, um, including uh, on here on this panel, I'm not including myself in that young, bright category, but um, we who've been around a little longer can support them uh, and help them you know, swim through walls, literally. That's, that's what they've got ahead uh, in their lives. So I think that's, that's the thing that comes to mind for me. And I know, um, you know, the Green School is doing that very thing, but really to, you know, to help, help those who need to be those heroes to actually become that. So um, you know, uniting the mermaids of the world uh, to support each other and, and, and keep the movement growing as, as part of it. But I think John made a, an important point. So the, the corporates hire the best and brightest. Among them are neuropsychologists. Uh, I don't know any NGOs that has a neuropsychologist on staff or on the board. But if we are in fact in the behavior change business, which is 100% of what we're in, and we don't have a neuropsychologist on our team, we are in fact not in the behavior change business. That's, that's a, as bluntly as I can put it. So I've, I'm, I've been on boards with fellow biologists and donors, and we think we're in the behavior change business. And I say, who on the staff understands human behavior really well? Look around and there's nobody. Who on the board uh, you know, has a background in behavior change? So I think that's, that's a, 
a, a way that we not only make the earth cool, but we, we also have some success is we, you know, borrow a page from uh, what Coca-Cola is doing. They have a neuroscience lab. Why would they have a neuroscience lab? Because they want to understand your brain better than you understand your brain in order to sell you things you don't want or need. And they're good at it. They use the word happiness. They use the word love. They own polar bears and Santa Claus. And that's how, that's the cleverness. Um, we've relied on guilt, shame, anger, fear, and factoids to propel our movement for too long. That doesn't work. It, I mean, your, your yes and is way better than no but. Um, you know, I think, I think the enthusiasm uh, that I hear from, you know, from Kate, from other people in the plastic pollution world, the enthusiasm, the positivity, the yes, let's do it this way. Here's, you know, and, and your example, how, what do you tell people to do? Well, you don't, you ask them a question, right? They do an inventory of their trash and then they find, figure out what to do. So that's, that's putting best neuropsychology into action. You don't tell people what to do because it, I know that as a dad of two teenagers, it just doesn't work. Uh, you ask them what they think they should do, or you ask them to ask their garbage can the question, and then the garbage can gives you the answer. It's your garbage. So I think that to me is the, it's, a, it's one point of optimism, is that when we, when we really do put our, our understanding of behavior change into action, for nature as some of the most clever businesses do i think we'll it's it'll be an accelerator so i guess that's that's one way um we make the earth cool again and and i have to say you're all doing it already we just need to kind of share that knowledge um with the small scrappy ngos and the, and the big ones as well um and get that that um mind state into these young clever people who are taking the jobs at these bigger companies yeah thank you yeah i'd love uh kate love you to kind of build on on john and jay jay and jay's thoughts and uh, and infuse some of your own in that yeah sure um i mean i think as jay was speaking to behavior change um, I, I mean, we're seeing so much the power of, of social change at the moment. We're seeing so many incredible um, movements taking root and how passion is, is being translated into um, social change um, and how we're being activated and how we can work together and collaborate. And we're so lucky to have the digital landscape to build on together and to connect, as Jay was saying, support each other and link arms. Um, and this is something that fascinates me. It's really exciting to me. And I think when we're looking to make the earth cool again, it is about um, empowerment and sovereignty and um, you know, going into ourselves and, and really assessing our value system and our ethics and um, choosing how we want to live and how we want to be an example to our kids or to our peers or to in our communities uh, because of the power of, of, of an individual, individual impact. Um, because I believe, you know, the, it's not the individuals who are, who are getting this wrong. It's our culture. It's our society. It's uh, that's so flush with plastics that we need this big change. Um, and after 10 years campaigning on the issue, the, the grassroots activist in me does believe in the power of individual change. Uh, and as, as um, John said, there's this handful of multinational corporations who are responsible for the majority of plastic pollution on our planet, Coca-Cola, Nestle, Unilever. And I think that the staunch refusal to buy plastics by us with the privilege, with the resources to do so, um, and specifically to, to refuse purchasing from these top companies, um, if enough of us are able to do that, uh, and, and I think that we have a moral responsibility to do so if we have the privilege. You know, these, these um, corporations are targeting Coca-Cola, they're targeting um, not only the West or the global North, but mostly, you know, the global South. They, and these people in Southeast Asia, in Indonesia, um, 
don't have any other options. You know, so much of their shampoo, their conditioner, their toothpaste are, are sold to them in tiny little sachets, the multi-material um, packaging that isn't recyclable. Uh, and it's ending up as pollution because they, they don't have the waste management systems in place. And then we were shipping all of our trash there as well. So um, yeah, it's a, it's an it can be feel overwhelming. And so I feel like um, yeah, education, asking questions, empowering us to be um, to research and, and understand these issues uh, more thoroughly. And and then you know being uh, being that inspiration. So as Jay said, bringing positivity. That's why I'm a mermaid, right? I bring a little bit of magic and mysticism to a movement that is kind of like, oh my gosh, plastic! It's the pollution is everywhere. What are we going to do? And and so to smile and laugh and inspire change. Um, that's how I think we can normalize the behaviors that we want to see in this regenerative future now is by is by doing them, making them look easy and good and, and finding, um, you know, creating movements around that and supporting the, the people, like Jay said, that are making this stuff happen and that are the leaders in their communities and giving them resources and giving them support because we are, we're up against big corporations and, um, but it's individuals in those roles as well. So once we have enough individuals refusing it, that sh this, this is going to shift the system. Um, and especially these people, these individuals in power, in corporate, in financial, in political roles who can make legislative or purchasing decisions that have real impact or whose kids come home and put the pressure on, you know? So it's, I, I think that um, the earth is, is cooling. I think we're doing it. I think we're, I'm, I'm optimistic. Yeah, no, thank you. I, I am as well. And I always say, I think one of the um, things that's sort of fundamental in the sustainable fashion movement is it's not even about making fashion sustainable as much as it's about making sustainability fashionable, right? Mm -hmm. So that it's, you know, more consumers will vote with their dollars and engage and make decisions that will drive businesses to make those changes. I'd love to hear from any of you, just, you know, things you've come across in the way of innovations that you think are either, you know, vitally important at this point or things you've seen that have really inspired you, um, you know, in this realm, because obviously there's a lot of work to do. So anyone here, dive, dive in. I have a random, random and somewhat tangential story that involves sea turtles. And I, I've worked in Latin America a lot, spe specifically in Mexico, in Baja California, sir. And with fishermen to save, save endangered sea turtles. And this has nothing to do with plastic pollution um, besides the fact that 100% of sea turtles will ingest plastic at some point during their lives, which is just a stunning uh, statistic to, to be able to even say. Um, but we're working with fishermen to try to keep sea turtles out of their nets because they didn't want to catch them. They wanted to catch their fish, but turtles were getting caught and drowning in their nets. And the old way of doing things was you make the fishermen into the enemy and then you just try to destroy the enemy by any means possible and get some legislation that attacks the enemy. And but the new way of thinking was to sit down, you know, free coffee and cookies, sit down and have a conversation with the people who know the turtles, the nets and the ocean the best, the, the you know, fishermen and women. And listen, actually listen. And then keep listening and then listen some more until all the ideas had come out. And then even at that point, keep listening. And you say, Wait, who, which of these ideas do you all think are the best? Let's, let's let them rise. Then you end up with a couple of the best ideas and then you implement them. So fast forward, um, that's what happened. The fishermen had great ideas. Uh, some of them were terrible ideas as we all have. And uh, sorry. And um, the black sea turtle has, has been making a comeback from the, the brink of extinction 25 years ago to being downlisted now uh, as the result of this in I mean, not even innovative, I just say common sense approach. So that example, I think, is, is kind of, you know, where, where we are. Is, you, know, you ask the enemy, how would you fix this problem? I think John alluded to this um, 
you maybe de-vilify the enemy because we tend to make our enemies into cartoon versions of villains and then they're scarier than they actually are in our minds. And, and that's not really healthy either. Um, so I, you know, I think that the answers probably are gonna come from within. The people who understand the material the best are best positioned to create that scalable solution. Um, and I think John, John alluded to that um, uh, in his, his comment of, uh, about you know, the cleverness, the best, the, the br young, bright minds. Um, but that's a hard one to stomach you know, for a lot of activists and advocates to say, okay, have that conversation with the so-called enemies and come up with a, a real solution. That's a, it's, it's hard for our in-group, out-group brains and our tribalism and our, our, you know, the, we, get, we put ourselves on teams and then our goal for our team is to destroy the other team. Um, so I think getting out of that state of mind where we're, we you know, view every, everyone as a, an enemy um, and figure out how to find the solution. So, um, but that's my turtle example. So, is it like true I said, that I love turtles. more turtles being born right now than anywhere <laughs> than any time ever before because of COVID? I mean, I know that set, whether I'm in Central Park, wherever I'm going, it's like uh, it's mind blowing how many turtles are <laughs> are out there. Turtles everywhere. <laughs> well, so. <laughs> That's a, that's, a, that's a long conversation. I'll, let me just say this. Three or four months of COVID is not the reason why there are more turtles. The reason is that there are people all over the world who have been working for decades and decades and decades. And now we have this little pause. But without, without the decades and decades and decades of work, you would not have this, this little pop of more turtles. Um, it's, a, it's a little, that's just not the way turtles work. Uh, they're long-lived, slow maturing, uh, late reproducing, um, beautiful animals. But it's not a it's not a, a a one spring sort of explosion. So that's my biologist hat for a moment there. Um, but yeah, the pause is good, and decades upon decades of committed advocacy, science, conservation, is really what we're seeing. So. Amazing. Um, and, and speaking of solutions, John, I would love you to touch on, you know, the work you and Cynthia have been doing with um, Bamboo and from Bamboo Inda to even the work you've done with Alora and, and the village, Ubuka Village, and, and really share, you know, how Bamboo has been a part of the solution for you in terms of making a difference. Okay. <laughs> I, have, I have a couple of um, ocean things that I was completely unaware of. And one of the questions that we use is, would you kill a pregnant cow for hamburgers? And people go, oh no, oh no, we wouldn't do that. But the fact is that half the fish that are caught are pregnant and full of eggs. And why are we doing that? And the second thing is, would you eat um, a leopard or a lion? And what we find out from our people that come to visit the school is that those incredible fish that people are celebrating are the top predators in the ocean. And the other thing about them is they're old. A 60 year old fish, I mean, would you cut down a 60 year old tree? No, clearly. But eat a 60 year old fish in a trendy restaurant? People just don't understand about what's really going on out there. And it's really simple stuff. And I learned a lot of this from Alexandra Cousteau, who's Jacques Cousteau's granddaughter who came to the school and she changed my way I look at fish and changed the way I think about the ocean because the ocean is terrifying for me. I was dumped in the ocean when I was in the 70s in Bali and I never went back until recently. A very incredible dive master took my hand and said, we're going. And 10 dives later in Raja Ampat, I was much more at home. But I did wonder if the shark that I saw was the same shark three times or three different sharks, because that was a big fear point for me. But I'll go back and being in the ocean is one of the most spiritually incredible things. 
But I will talk to you a little bit about bamboo. Bamboo is super fast growing. Bamboo sequesters more carbon than, than any other living, any other living thing. Everyone's talking about planting a tree. But the fact is you plant a tree and 30 or 40 years later, you cut the tree down. Whereas bamboo, you have a mother who lives under the ground and she's shooting up new shoots every year. And once those shoots are three years old, they're timber and you can cut them. And mother, when they get cut, mother goes, oh, new shoots every rainy season. And it is such an exciting material. It's something that we can promise everyone on the planet. And that's, we can't promise them all, all the cement they need. We can't promise them all the steel they need. We can't even promise them all the timber they need. The only promise we can make to every child is plant bamboo now and you'll have enough for a house later. And for anyone who has not seen uh, John's TED Talk, um, please check it out. We'll, um, we'll share those links as well. And Alora's TED Talk as well. Um, they're both amazing and super inspiring. Um, so thanks for all that great work. I know you've, you've certainly inspired a lot of uh, people all over the world around bamboo. And I can't tell you how many times people have said to me, wow, I'm modeling my home after, you know, what I read about what, you know, John and Cynthia Hardy are doing. And, and so it's, um, you've been such a great force. And knowing the, the relationship to climate change um, and carbon capture is, is so powerful and obviously um, reinforcing the, you know, what are the tools that we have to make America cool again, or the world, sorry, the planet cool again. <laughs> um, and uh, just trying to rejig that verbiage there. Um, but, but Kate, I'd love your thoughts as well. What are some of the, you know, um, the ways that you, you envision, you know, driving change and, and positive, um, a positive force to address the climate change issue? And, uh, and why is it so important to keep plastic out of our oceans? A lot of questions there, Marcy. <laughs> I'll do my best. Um, yeah, I think I think like John said, plant, teach people to plant things. You know, have a relationship with nature. Get your hands dirty. Grow your own food. The more things that we can be connected to in our life, um, the better for ourselves, for our well-being, as well as for the planet. Um, in terms of innovation, uh, I'm really excited about a lot of the plastic alternative innovation that's happening. Um, you know, seaweed especially and, and mushrooms that are able to ingest plastic. I mean, there's a lot of incredible science in this space because we have woken up to the problem of plastic pollution. Um, but we also, we can't continue to replace single use culture with more materials. Um, so we really need to eliminate our, cult our cultural attachment to single use items. Um, so that's where I think the the innovation is important, um, is around behavior change and around our, our use of materials and things. And like um, John said, you know, going back to just using leaves, just the truly compostable materials that people have been using in, in Bali for ages um, before we infiltrated with this, with this Western packaging. Um, it's a shame that, that COVID has caused more use of takeaway food packaging, um, but there are scientists stepping up to show that it's not dangerous to our health to bring clean reusables. So um, yeah, I think it's about culture shift. I think it's, um, you know, as we, like the reuse revolution is really exciting to me, refilleries, bulk foods, um, making this more accessible. Uh, there's an incredible alliance called Break Free From Plastics uh, that is working on zero waste cities. So helping um, cities in particular in the Philippines to set up the, the systems to um, manage their waste, to sort and, and separate the trash that is being created in a village, um, you know, and really sorting it out to finding what they can repurpose, what they can sell, um, what they can grow, what they can compost. Um, and also empowering those waste pickers and empowering those, those service providers to in, in their society to be less of a, um, you know, a role that's looked down on. Uh, so I think that programs like that, that, that Breakthrough from Plastic is, is really spearheading um, to empower these communities to deal with plastics and then also a lot like helping support those businesses to have more refill, um, uh, like access to refill 
in their villages. So yes, in, we are starting to see some of these trendy um, stores um, coming out with refilleries and, and which sometimes are out of the price point are, are, are inaccessible to many Americans or people um, depending on their, what they have access to, what, where they're in, where they live, their geographic location. So um, it's incredible to see, to support the work of Break Free From Plastic and, and other organizations that are, are working to um, make these solutions in the reuse, refill, repurpose regenerate um, this, this new culture that we need to create, that we need to support. Um, yeah, and making them accessible to all. So it's not just uh, us who have kind of the privilege to choose, um, but that these, these environmental choices can be more accessible. Um, I think that that's the innovation we need. we need. We need more reuse culture and we need to make it more accessible um, to all demographics. So yeah, w what was the question again? <laughs> No, I think, you know, you, you've covered a lot. I mean, I think really, um, you know, kind of shedding light, especially in lieu of this topic today, as to why is plastic so harmful to our ocean ecosystems and, 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 and to ultimately, in, in light of, you know, the blue mind, to our sense of, of being connected as, as individuals, as humans on this planet. I'd love... Jay, maybe if you can speak to that, you know, from a yeah. lens of an ocean um, conservationist, marine biologist. Yeah, so, you know, we know, we know increasingly about the ecological impacts. You know, we, we hear about the seabirds and the sea turtles and, and the ingestion by fish. And, and now even at the, you know, the level of plankton, you know, the, the organisms that are basically the, the base of the food chain are eating this microplastic. So we have a increasingly strong understanding and we communicate that pretty well um, there's an economic impact of course so you know um, um, pollution is is um, often bad for our, our economy but there's also an emotional impact that gets almost always left out and so if people are going to the beach all over the world to reduce their stress and they are um, all over the world, all cultures, all traditions use the water to reduce stress, to, to boost creativity, to connect, reconnect, because our society is, has so much anxiety and our media is filling us with anxiety and our technology is ubiquitous. Um, if the water is a source of emotional health and we pollute it and make it gross, it takes that away. It robs us of one of the, the best um, therapies available to all of us and I, I had a, an example I used to take my kids to the beach and I thought it was wonderful and then one day my daughter Julia she was eight she said dad we don't like going to the beach with you and I said what uh, I love it she said it's disgusting every time we go to the beach you make us clean up other people's disgusting trash and sometimes it really was disgusting. As you know, if you've done a beach cleanup, sometimes it's pretty gross stuff. And I just remember standing there thinking, all right, the best part of my life is going to the beach with my daughters and getting in the ocean. So the best thing in life. And they think it's disgusting. She said, not only is it disgusting, it's unjust. You're making us do this, clean up other people's trash. And it just made me think, well, if I'm taking the best thing in my life and turning it into a disgusting, unjust experience. And then she said, not only do we not like it, our friends don't like going to the beach with you either. And so I, it broke, kind of broke my heart, but it made me think how important it is to have that time with your loved ones at the edge where the water meets the land. And that emotional piece that we discount, and when we discount it, we exclude it, and we exclude it, we undervalue. Um, so it's, that's really the impact of, of this plastic pollution. And I think this is the strong message for those who are creating the plastic pollution. Not only are you having a, a negative economic impact in a horrific uh, ecological footprint, but you're also destro destroying our emotional health in the process of taking away one of the greatest sources of healing and therapy available to us. Uh, our first responders, uh, the firefighters and police, 
who you know serve us uh, in the you know I ideal scenarios, uh, veterans, um, anybody dealing with an extra load of anxiety who who has a service career that runs towards danger on our behalf. Many of those people rely on a healthy ocean, lakes, rivers, waters, just to stay in the game, just to remain an ER nurse day in and day out. So in the time of COVID, those people who serve us are under so much more pressure and anxiety on our behalf, even journalists. They need, you know, they really need therapy and, and daily. And if the ocean is the best therapy and we're wrecking that, we're taking it away from them. So that, to me, that's kind of a more holistic view of, as a scientist, the impacts of plastic pollution on, you know, of course, on, on all of the life in the ocean, the non-human life, of course, on our economy, but also uh, on our emotional health. And so that would be, you know, for those who are listening, add that to your talking points uh, when, you, when you find yourself in a position to share the impact of plastic pollution. Um, it's not just the turtles and the fish and the whales and the plankton. It's also, you know, the, our human emotional health. Um, and if our emotional health is the basis of sustainability, which I think it is, then that's not, that's no good. We need, we need to add that to our talking point. So, um, the turtle theme is a big one. Turtles, unfortunately, have become a, a poster species for climate change and overfishing bycatch and plastic pollution um and uh i love turtles a lot so i see all of the impacts uh on those animals from all those directions uh especially plastic these days um i think john could probably remember the days when you know turtles didn't eat plastic uh, a turtle beach didn't have if you picked up the plastic on the turtle beach it was clean again and now these days you go and you go back every day, every, maybe every hour and start over. Uh, it really used to be, I remember walking beaches in Costa Rica and you see something, you pick it up and then the beach was clean because you picked it up. Uh, and now it's, it's certainly evolved uh, to almost a near constant need for um, cleaning those beaches up so the turtles don't have to climb over or dig through the plastic to lay their eggs uh, or eat it for that matter. Yeah. John, it looks like uh, maybe maybe uh, final in the spirit of time, final last words, and also how can people learn more about the work that you and Cynthia are doing and your, all of your family in addition to uh, final thoughts? Well, I just, I just wanted to say about the kids, you turn them into detectives. And the strange thing is that um, all that garbage, almost all of it, has a logo on it. And I was speaking to a, a CEO of a major polluter. And I was, uh, we were talking about the male behavior, the executive male behavior, and how they're being trained to become more sensitive to how they are in this new world. And we see what a little video did in America for everyone's desire to have people look after people and not and not the other. So I said to her, you know, aren't you embarrassed to see your logo in the ditch, in the stream, in the river, in the ocean? Doesn't that bring up a little fear in you that people might start? So the thing you can get your girls to do if they're still in the mood, have them post a logo or two logos or five logos from the beach and say, hello, you ruined my day at the beach with my dad because your garbage is on my beach and you need to do something about that because every one of these corporate brands has a Facebook, has an Instagram, and you can post it right up there. You can hashtag it and you can put it right in with their Instagram so it isn't all just people dancing in the park and drinking diabetes. It becomes an embarrassment because we have embarrassed a lot of groups of people and we're in the moment of where we start embarrassing the corporates with their own logos and how they are disrupting 
are moments of pleasure everywhere in the world by dumping their garbage on the planet. Green by John and Cynthia is um, where Cynthia and I speak about what we're doing almost every month. And uh, Green School is an incredible possibility for the future where we're building a, something that's very unusual that the parents came to Bali to bring their children to the school. And they came for a year often going, well, let's have a year with our children before we're old and hoping they'll visit the old age home. And it was very dangerous because the children just stood up and said, dad, figure it out. Mom, figure it out. We're going to graduate from green school. So we're here for another four years. And it's uh, when the school opens in Mexico, it's going to be a huge hit because it's close. You can get back to America and do whatever you do a few days a month and have your family living in a living in a place going to a school that makes a difference. I love it. My son said after you and I spoke last night, he said, Mom, should I go move to because he's he was destined for Broadway, but Broadway is shut down because of COVID. And he said, Mom, should I move to New Zealand and and volunteer at the Green School? I said, that's a great idea. <laughs> So it's yeah. the best thing. It's the best thing ever. It attracts like minded people. Most international schools prey on the corporates that are there doing whatever they're doing to the earth and their children. But Green School tends to collect the individuals from, we have people at Green School from 35 different countries who made the decision to bring their children to the education. Absolutely. Thank you for the great work that you and Cynthia and all of your girls are, are doing in the world. And um, Kate, we love uh, final thoughts and how can people learn more about the work that you're doing um, and join up some of your, your educational uh, sessions as well? Yeah, thanks, Marcy. I want to go to green school. <laughs> you green school for adults? <laughs> That is that is a common that is a common statement. Great idea. <laughs> oh, you have to you have to get some adult programming for us. Um, yeah, I I think I mean there's so much to say, right? Closing thoughts. Um, I do think that one of the things from your previous question about um, why is it so why is plastic so dangerous? Um, I kind of I feel like I've had a few plastics awakenings, you know, the first one where it's like, oh my gosh, plastic pollution, it's so ubiquitous, it's everywhere. Um, it's in the oceans, it's causing whales to die. And then the second awakening where it's like, oh, it's my consumption of this plastic. It's I, I can make a change. Um, and then the, the next awakening I had was, <laughs> oh, it's actually really toxic. Um, and when we ingest it, there's many ways that it gets into our bodies. It acts like estrogen in our bodies and it impacts our endocrine system. It impacts our reproductive system. It causes us to gain weight, um, to get depressed, to become infertile. Um, and not only us, but the marine creatures or the, the, you know, the fish in the rivers, um, it's having the same impact on all the, the species that it's impacting. Uh, and Yes, that's a concern, but I think people respond most to things that impact us individually. So knowing that it makes us get fat, sick, and infertile, that should be so motivating for us to want to eliminate it from our ecosystem, from what we use on a daily basis, and from what our families touch. Um, the more plastic we have in our curtains, on our, our carpet, like in, in our kitchens that we're touching, we're touching, it's, it's shedding these little micro particles. And we actually, it's buoyant. Plastic is really buoyant. You think of a plastic bag that floats in the wind. Um, so when we shuffle across the carpet or touch the curtain or open a Coke bottle, open, open, um, or rustle chip bags or plastic packaging, it's all shedding these particles that then hover like a cloud around us. And we're all kind of in these plastic clouds and we inject, we inhale that, we breathe that and it lodges in our lungs. Um, or if we're using all these plastic containers to store our food or plastic packaging to store our food, it's shedding into our food. Um, it also leaches, it leaches these toxins into whatever it's containing. So there's all these 
um, horrific pathways for, for the chemicals in plastic to make their inner body and then they have a toxic impact. So that's really motivating. That's something that I speak to a lot in my activism um, because I find it really motivating. Um, more so than, unfortunately, not everybody has a relationship with the ocean or with sea turtles or with whales or dolphins. And so I used to speak to that a lot as a mermaid. Um, but I realized that, oh, actually plastic causing premature aging and weight gain is, that gets them straight away. Um, so I think, yeah, like, like Jay said, kind of finding your talking points um, is really important in this. And I, I teach a lot of that. Um, maybe, maybe I have a, a, a version of um, green school for adults. I don't know. I'd, I'd love to think of it that way, but it's where, where I teach, um, yeah, I, I host mermaid retreats um, where we connect with the ocean, where we go sailing and um, diving with whale sharks and, and whales and um, reconnect with the water element and, and really tune into that blue mind experience. Um, and, and I teach environmental activism and I teach plastic free living and I teach um, empowerment and coming back to ourselves and our relationship um, with with ourselves and our ecosystem and how to impact the world. Um, but I can't do those right now because of COVID. So I'm, I'm doing online programs. I'm doing an online mermaid retreat. It's called Plastics Awakening. So people can check that out at iquitplastics.com, my website. I also wrote a book, which I brought here today. <laughs> so this is um, just a really basic guide to quitting plastics. Um, I don't think it's hard. Um, I try to make it really accessible and easy for people. Uh, you know, it's lots of recipes. I make um, all my own beauty products and bath products and, and plant milks and crackers and all things wrapped in plastic I make myself. So keeps the recipes in here. So if anybody's interested in trying or starting the lifestyle, there's lots of strategies in my book, I Put Plastics, available online anywhere. Thank you, Marcy. I <laughs> love it. And uh, yes, yeah, so I was just thinking, give away Eco Ren and you know your book, and let's uh, yeah pushing that out there, make it easy. I love that. Um, and Jay, I love uh, to hear your closing thoughts and and how can people learn more. <coughs> well, well, I just say I'm honored to listen and learn from all of you today, and and. Um, if you've been listening to this, maybe rewind and listen again to the spots that you want to really remember, because there's been a lot, a lot of really good insights shared. Uh, and that's one of the beautiful things about these recorded sessions. We can go back and slightly rewind and re-listen and let it let it sink in a little bit deeper. So thank you for including me. Um, I I'll just add that, you know, the ocean is not full of plastic yet. The planet is not dead yet. It's amazing. We're so lucky. We live here um, on this little blue marble. It's a beautiful home. Um, you know, the turtles and whale sharks and beaches and plankton and fish. And, and it's just such a great place to explore. So, you know, you fight for what you love. So fall in love. Keep falling in love every day with your part of it because it's not, you know, the game's not over. It's not even close. We've got so much life and um, so many bright spots and so much optimism and, and we got to win this. Uh, so that's one, one thought. I mean, there's lots, when you're getting in the trenches, you can get, be easily overwhelmed and that that's red mind and that red mind can turn into gray mind, which is burnout. Don't do that. Don't let that happen. Um, it breaks my heart to see young activists burning out. Uh, that's that's no good. So take care of yourself. Get in the water. Find your find your happy place, and keep your yourself emotionally strong. Um, but on, in a more specific thing, I, I just want to plant a seed, uh, and for you especially, uh, with your background in in fashion and in eco fashion, um, we talk a lot about microfibers uh, from our clothes. But I'm I'm slightly obsessed with the bottoms of shoes right now. So most bottoms of shoes are made of some form of plastic and we are micro abrading, creating nanoplastics with every step on the earth with the, with our plastic soles. Uh, I, I'm not an expert on soles of shoes. I don't know where all that plastic is going, but I look at my, the bottoms of my shoes and they wear down like they're disappearing. Right. And they're not disappearing into nowhere. 
they're disappearing into others. So billions of people, each with two shoes, walking uh, on surfaces is, is creating a, a phenomenon, at the very least, of nanoplastic pollution. Um, I would love to use that message to really support the shoemakers that are doing it right. And there are a handful of truly sustainable, brilliant companies that are making eco shoes and they're cool. Uh, they're good looking, but they're made out of natural materials. So I, I just want to leave, kind of leave that um, on your doorstep there as a, an idea related to plastic pollution, the unsung plastic pollution that comes off the bottoms of our feet every step we take in a tiny, tiny way. Um, so Kate, you know, talking about that cloud of plastic around us, well, we're also leaving kind of like a, um, a trail of plastic behind us with every step. And it's very, very small. And mm -hmm. it just washes away into our waterways uh, after it rains uh, or is swept, uh, you know, out the door. So, um, you know, pay attention to what's on the bottoms of your feet as well as what goes in your mouth and what's in your hands and what's on your bodies and make, make beautiful choices, I think is what I would uh, like leave there as my last statement. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you so much. And Yes, we need to step forward without plastic. The um, plastic free step. <laughs> right. Um, work is love made visible. So speaking of love, oh, go ahead, John. <laughs> I, I would uh, love for you to list the people that are doing shoes right. Me too. Because the number of flip-flops floating in the ocean is beyond comprehension. And they are, it's not good. And I've had real trouble finding any shoe that, and the deal about shoes is very simple. There's less than 50 cents worth of plastic in most running shoes. And when they sell them for $200 or $300, you can imagine how profitable that is. And it's time we did something about shoes. Thank you for that part. Yeah, yeah I agree. One, the one that comes to mind, um, I know Parlay for the Oceans has partnered with Adidas um, mm -hmm. and, um, and, and Stella McCartney and has made some you know, ocean plastic um, shoes, which uh, that comes to mind quickly. But but I think that is a good sort of takeaway is to provide when we go live, you know, some of those good shoe companies that people can support. But yes, mm -hmm. a long way to go there. And and going back to, you know, kind of as an entrepreneur, uh, a quote that I, I love is, work is love made visible, which is from the prophet Khalil Gibran. And I think we all need to realize and remember that if you love your work, it's not work, it's love. And we need to spread that love and do good work in the world. And, and good business is five Ps, people, planet, profit, passion, and purpose. And so um, I thank all of you for being here today from the bottom of my heart. Um, as the founder and CEO of Eco Fashion Corp, we're just getting started. Um, I'm proud, you know, Metaware, our division that does B2B manufacturing is partnered with 4Ocean. So um, we've made all their t-shirts out of organic cotton, which I'm a, an organic and regenerative agriculture junkie. Um, so another part of the, you know, our, our ecosystems that um, is, a, is a part of the solution is uh, staying away from synthetics. Because um, obviously, you know, we haven't found those solutions yet in terms of how do we keep them out of our our oceans, even the recycled polys are still breaking down into microfibers that are still going into the ocean. So while it Thank might- Thank you for saying that. <laughs> yes, I'm, a, I'm all about, let's keep our seas plastic free. So this is a t-shirt from Yes And, our newest baby. Yes, uh, style, quality, fit, color, comfort, and price, and organic, sustainable, fair trade, ethically made responsible. And that is to me the way of the world, um, hopefully for the future that eco fashion is the future of fashion and no longer the alternative, but instead the norm. So um, to that end, I would, again, I want to thank all of you, John, Jay, Kate, thank you for being a part of this session and for all the great work you're doing in the world. Um, thank you, Fashion and the Oceans, Global Fashion Exchange, Patrick Duffy, United Nations, Peace Boat, and everybody else who um, is curating this incredible um, group of speakers over the course of the last few days and 
um, ending with grand finale today. So um, keep up all of your great work. Let's wear the change and see the change, S-E-A, that we wish to see in the world. So thank you. Thank you all. Here's a marble for everybody. I'd love to pass that on right there. That's for you. You have to grab it, though. There you go. Love it. Thank <laughs> if you. If we were in the same room, I would hand you one, but, you know, we're socially Vir distanced. Virtually, I caught it. Yeah. So, big virtual hugs for all of you. Thank you again, and um, peace out. Be well. Stay safe. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, guys. Thank you.